Welcome to Trash Arts Take with me, Sam, and Jackson. Hey. Now, as you may have heard the day before on May the 4th, Ryan did his whole Star Wars thing with Mike Reed and Kieran Edwards. So he's not on this show because today's show, we first have an interview with Uganda filmmaker Edris Adams. And then after that, we're going to have a little chat about Star Wars from an alternative take on people who don't particularly like Star Wars. Yeah, we're, we're, we are not Star Wars fans, um, and we're just going to explain why. Uh, feel free to disagree with us. But first, here's an interview with Edris Adams, good buddy of mine. Enjoy. Okay, I am here with Edris Adams for Trash Arts Talk. How you doing, man? You good? Yes. Excellent. So how did you get into filmmaking? Can you, um, sorry, your phone, is your phone vibrating because it keeps vibrating? Sorry. Your phone keeps vibrating aggressively. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me try to see how I can. Okay. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you that question again just because the phone went off a few times. Yeah. So, Edris, how did you get into filmmaking? Okay, uh, I got into filmmaking I uh, five years back I've been into the industry but uh, I joined through passion because I'm a mass communicator so I worked with different TV stations you know and uh, I had a passion of film since I was a camera person I had to join film uh, because of passion, I never went to school uh, to learn. Uh, but uh, because of passion and the skills that I got from the university by then, uh, I joined the industry. Yeah. And what was your uh, first project? Uh, I think uh, I did my first project was a short film. It was a short film that I. I did with my friends at the campus and it was called Susanna. Uh, this was more uh, advocating for girls' rights. Uh, basically, it was talking more about how, you know, girls are being gifted, you know, uh, and they sleep on them, you know. At the end of the day, they miss out campus, they miss out school, you know. Uh, uh, because of small, small gifts, yeah. Uh, it was a small, a, a short film uh, about, uh, 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 you know, high school short film. Uh, before, uh, before that, uh, I'd done a movie with my friend, which was a feature film. Actually, because of passion and everything, we thought we could. Uh, hire some people to work with them and then they are somehow experienced, you know. Uh, so through that we hired someone to help us more because we thought he knows more, more than us. And uh, the film never went well actually until now we still have the footage or I still have the footage on my hard drives. Uh, I failed to it because never came out how I wanted, but still, uh, I didn't, you know, stop from there because of the passion and everything. I continue, I continue, uh, you know, making research, you know, mm. uh, getting here and there, you know, without, I mean, not fixing the other wound that I was, I mean, I passed through because of uh, not, you know, uh, getting what I wanted, you know, from one of my friends who liked me, but <laughs> that he, he has skills, you know, to film, and we can work together. So, yeah. 
That's awesome, man. Now, tell us a bit about you, because you own um, a company called Radar Media Consultants, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah tell us yeah, a bit yeah. about that. Okay, um, I'm a freelancer, filmmaker, and documentary maker, and uh, I'm based in Uganda. So, when I left working with media companies, I thought of starting up something like a company that can sustain me, where I can get some jobs, I can, you know, uh, sustain myself. So I thought of starting up a company. So we started up a company, as you know, uh, things of film, they are not, some. I mean, something easy. So we started up a company with a group of people behind me and uh, we started, you know, working here and there uh, because of, you know, everyone has his own passion. So we had to separate. So through separating from that company, it was called Address Media Concert. And then uh, I joined, uh, I mean, I made my own company uh, that I uh, could real, you know, make me comfortable at doing my own things. And uh, it's Rada Media Concerts uh, Limited. Rada Media Concerts Limited, basically, uh, we do, uh, it's a media company based in Uganda, free registered by the rules of Uganda. And uh, I think it's uh, um, a company that does uh, a lot of media work, uh, TV programs, you know, uh, TV shows, you know, uh, we can compose, you know, uh, a TV program, you know, design it, shoot it, and then take it on a TV, we negotiate how we can work together, so uh, we do documentaries, adverts, you know, uh, corporate adverts, you know, uh, we do films, do advocating films, yeah, so... That's how uh, Radar Media runs, and that's how I collaborate with Radar Media. It's uh, my company, and I'm a director. That's fantastic, man. Now, how do you find uh, making films in Uganda? Well, what does uh, does Uganda give any support or help? Or because I, I, if it's anything like my country, I imagine they don't give you any help whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, uh, you know, uh, making films in Uganda, it's uh, a hard thing so far, mm, I may say, because when you look at our roles uh, that governing uh, the art industry, uh, not so, you know, they are not put in, in action uh, because we don't have other copyright uh, enforcement that is really in place that can enforce uh, people, you know, to respect what we call the art of people or, you know, uh, our work as artists or as filmmakers too at large, you know. So some are complex that are, we are still fighting so that we can have, a, you know, a copyright being put in place and, uh, you know, being governed very well, you know, then we start working with other people, you know, uh, from, you know, different countries. Though we are working with them, we, are, we work with them currently, but if copyright is put in place, I think we can benefit more. So, the, uh, the company, I mean, the country uh, doesn't, you know, uh, fund anything so far. To the art industry, uh, it's all about you uh, getting your money from somewhere. Mm. If you want to go and do your project, do your project, you know. So nothing big that comes from um, the government, like other countries, like in Hollywood, in UK, you know, uh, in India, you know, in uh, Nigeria, you know. So. Here, you struggle alone to reach where you want to go. Yeah. 
How do you find uh, marketing films outside of Uganda? Because I know that you and I met through, um, you wanted some advice and I got you in touch with the non-exclusive VOD site versus media. But you also got me in touch with uh, Dom Cinema. So how do you find working with non-exclusive markets like that? Oh, well, so about the market, I, uh, it's all about also, you know, uh, passion of what you want to do. Uh, I may say you have to, you know, shoot a movie, you know, after shooting, you know, you have to look for a, a market, you know, so it's basically your own way how you can, you know, uh, approach a market. And to me, uh, I do reach out to people, you know, uh, that I get on social media, you know, or someone may tell me, you know, there's someone in U.S. Uh, he's buying movies and reach him out or her, see what he's thinking about your movies. So that's how I try to get the market and try to reach out uh, different people in India, uh, in uh, U.S. because in India soon the will be uh, screening my movies and uh, I've been working with a certain company in US. It's called uh, Venice. Uh, it also has some online channels that uh, stream live. So basically that's how I do get market, but it's somehow complex. And I, I call upon if there is any, you know, uh, any company that is willing to, you know, buy my movies and my work. Yeah, they can recontact me. And uh, I have, I, I think I have some good content, you know. Yeah. Totally understand, man. And what are you working on at the moment? At the moment, do you have any future projects? Uh, because of uh, this uh, corona epidemic, epidemic uh, I was shooting, but uh, we stopped. And uh, because of what is going through, uh, current, uh, uh, I had a project uh, in Kenya uh, that I was going to shoot, that is our neighboring country. Uh, I was traveling to Kilimanjaro soon. There's one of my friends from uh, US I used to work with. Uh, wanted me to work with him on set. Uh, I had my own project, my own feature film that I was shooting. Uh, but uh, we stopped and uh, we'll be resuming soon. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Let's hope you can get back to those projects soon. Well, I have one more question for you. If you had like no budget, no country restraints, whatever you wanted to film, what would be your dream project? Um, I think uh, I'd love to, to do, you know, a massive project that can cut across the world. Uh, working with different, you know, film producers, you know, directors, you know, and uh, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that. I'd love to be on such a set. Though, uh, sometimes dreams come true. Uh, soon I'll be, I mean, uh, we had uh, some arrangements, uh, like in August, uh, we'll be working on a big set. Uh, I have my friends that are from uh, Hollywood. Uh, we've been together here in Uganda f uh, for a couple of days, uh, making pilot study. We'll be shooting a project about uh, upcoming musicians, how they struggle in Uganda to reach on top. And uh, we've been on survey, we've been on uh, piloty, you know, been working on little, little things on ground, following up some upcoming musicians, you know, how they struggle, how they reach on stage and everything. It is a project that uh, 
I think I was going to engage him that is too, too big and 70% or 90% it's our local, you know, people that are, will be, you know, uh, shooting it, you know, directing, you know, uh, working on it, you know, acting, you know. So, yeah, I'm waiting for such a time to happen too. That's awesome, man. That sounds really cool. And hopefully we can um, get some more updates and tell people about it on the podcast. Well, thank you very much for joining us, man. And uh, I hope you have a lovely day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So another thing before uh, I leave. Uh, no worries. Here in Uganda, yeah, here in Uganda uh, you know, making a movie is not something easy. Uh, what I resorted to, it's a... Uh, starting something like a, a community-based uh, organization whereby you can create the youth to come together and uh, we work together uh, teaching them some skills, you know, uh, empowering them to film and uh, we uplift different talents. So I've done that and uh, I'm now successful. I don't usually engage uh, uh, big actors like uh, Hollywood is and Bollywood. So I do basically community thing and willingness of the people. So that's how sometimes I do shoot my movies. That's awesome, man. Like you have a similar attitude that I know um, that we try to have as filmmakers and other people that I've spoken to. It's all about when we're independent and when we don't have those budgets, it's about supporting and getting people creating. So it's awesome, man. Right, so man. that's how, you know, we do something, you know, we work out something here. Definitely, man. Right, you have a lovely day and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, thank you too to reaching me, uh, for reaching me out. I'm so happy and humbled. Uh, I think we'll be sharing the link of uh, uh, this interview and then we share it to the world. No worries, man. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Yesterday was May the 4th, which for a, a big proportion of people is significant. Now today is Revenge of the 5th, so we're going to look at some contrasting points to what they may have discussed yesterday. Now we're not going to talk about story, because we're not here to rip apart the storytelling of Star Wars. For one, I have not seen all the Star Wars films. <laughs> no. <clears throat> No, not the, the. I haven't seen the more recent ones. Um, I think the last one that probably you and I both saw was. Um, I can't even remember what they're called because there's so many names. Force Awakens. Oh yeah. When they brought Star Wars back, and then after that it was like, there's one every year now. <laughs> <laughs> and the 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 problem with Star Wars that we want to look at is how it's affected the industry. Yeah. And, and affected film culture generally. Like I think yeah. it's it had a massive impact, and I, in my opinion, I don't think all of that has been good. No. Um, yeah. Now the original Star Wars came out in 1977, and before the film came out, George Lucas got a collection of directors together who were like pretty relevant back then. So we had Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma, Steven Spielberg, and some other guys that I can't remember their names. And essentially, the cut they saw was very rough. The CGI and a lot of that stuff wasn't in there. They'd changed the, um, I don't know what they're called, the, the flying machines in Star Wars. <laughs> they changed them the for... The spaceships. The spaceships. <laughs> they changed the spaceships to, like, old clips of, from war in, like, the 40s and 50s planes. And they used some other music, which wasn't the original score. And the director's response was not good. <laughs> Spielberg apparently saw some merit to it, but it's Spielberg, what do you expect? Brian De Palma, from the quote I read, response was just like, sorry, what is this shit? <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola was very angry because at this point they were trying to make art films that could be profitable and successful in their own right. If we remember that the blockbuster before Star Wars was films like Godfather, the Exorcist. Mm. They were the films that were critically acclaimed in good storytelling. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things, like, 
from that response, George Lucas apparently felt like his life was over, felt like it was ruined, but obviously had to continue making the film, and the rest is history. Yeah. And it changed everything. It changed that very notion of what could be, what the studios wanted to focus success on. Well, it sort of took the, the B movie and, and played up to the sort of popular elements of that and sort of inserted like this um, A movie kind of seriousness into that that, that wasn't self aware, wasn't, um, didn't have that same sense of fun and silliness and creativity to it. Um, and as much as like I can't say that Star, you know Star Wars is massively creative and yeah. the, the way that they built can't deny it, the craft. yeah of course the craft is incredible but I I feel like the the impact it had on film from there made made these B movies more like more more serious and and took away from that that sort of aspect because you don't really get B movies like you did in the in the early seventies and and the eighties and the, the, you know that sort of time period it's it's whittled out well no yes it's again it's, it's studios wanting to go well, where's the next star wars where's the next thing that's gonna make us lots of money and because like george lucas and we you know you can't not talk about spielberg being part of this spielberg's whole brand was pushing that towards that and it changed it just changed where the the creative focus was was it the filmmaking money or was it what the creative wanted to do and i think star wars unfortunately was a big part of that um you can just you can just see there's a great book by uh, Peter Baskin's Easy Rider Raging Bull, and it looks at the film scene from 1969, from when Easy Rider came in and changed everything, and the crop of directors who just kept making brilliant films that made money. And sure, they were based on books; they weren't all original properties. Um, but after that, <clears throat> when you get towards the Spielberg and, and towards George Lucas, you slip into the 80s where everything changed and it became industry focused in that way and brand focused. Mm. And Star Wars is the ultimate brand. That's why Disney paid so much money for it. Yeah. And that, that's the problem. Like, sure, you can be like, oh, but the original Star Wars film is like, yeah, but there's a whole lot more of it now. And it's never ending. It just mm. won't stop. <laughs> and I think that, that merchandising mm. in Star Wars, it was one of the first really big merchandising films that made an awful lot of money out of merchandising. And it did change the way that studios looked at what film could be in terms of the asset that it could produce. I think and so, you know, it, it became much more, um, com uh, like much more compelling to, to create a film that could sell a toy as opposed to one that was just a good story or a good film itself. Well, I think um, that's, that's the other thing. And, and it made the studio's main priority to do family films. Mm. Films that would appeal to children so they'd want to buy the toys, and the adults would still be entertained by the old adventures that they've seen a hundred times, but just in a new, shiny form. And, like, studios, I mean, I'm, I'm probably wrong, but I can't think of loads of major films that are aimed around families in the 70s, mm. in general. It's a bit of a big kind of assumption, but compared to where the 80s and 90s and where we are now, of where the studio's main focus is family-oriented films, and unfortunately, family-oriented films don't always allow to have the... the the um, the depth of story sometimes. Well, you you have especially to... with the directors who were coming out in the seventies. Yeah, I mean, I think that any artistic form has to has to challenge its audience, and that's that's the problem is with with that kind of family content is that how how do you challenge that without upsetting people, without sort of causing some sort of controversy? Um, yeah, and I think Star Wars definitely contributed to that that direction that the studio saw the money in. Well, if we jump like right towards now, when it comes to that sort of when you do try to do something in a Star Wars film, again, haven't seen them, but you've seen the online response to trying to be even remotely progressive or do any changes within the Star Wars world. The fans become very toxic. Yeah, and I feel like they to a certain extent have ruined their own they ruined their own uh, uh, film franchise that, yeah. they, that they absolutely they obviously have loved it to death I think um, and the thing is because Disney is in charge right now all they want to do is feed the fans exactly what they want so if you try to bring any challenging ideas and I think this is a general creative thing in Star Wars completely is that whenever you try to bring 
a director or a creative who wants to do something different within Star Wars, someone will stop it. Or, like in the 80s, when David Cronenberg was offered the job, he turned it down. When David Lynch was offered the job, as soon as he saw the Ewoks, <laughs> he just, that was it. He was done. But you come back to now and you have directors who are genuinely brilliant, like um, Phil Lord, the Lord of Miller di- directors, the guys who do Lego Movie, mm. 21 Jump Street. They were the original directors of Han Solo. But because of their style involved more of an improvised way, and they pushed it into directions like that, which steered away from the Star Wars scripts, which are pretty much written by every Star Wars person, they, they fired them. And, you know, good old Ron Howard came in to save the day. But they kept doing this. There's also Josh Trank, who was going to direct a Star Wars film, but because he upset one producer of a 20th Century Fox film, he lost a job. Star Wars directors that don't tend to stay in one position unless they're like J.J. Abraham, who jump in just because they know it's going to steer it towards some sort of money at the end of the day. Well, I think J.J. Uh, Abraham is, is quite a <coughs> journey director, really. Like, I, I, I think that, you know, when he first... When, Star Trek first happened like when he first did Star Trek everyone was kind of like wow there's a real style to this but as it as it's gone on I feel like it's it's style over substance really with with him but um, well he's he wants brands that's why yeah. like he you know did the whole 500 million contract with Warner Brothers because they have more IP mm. Apple offered it but he was like you don't have any original you know any franchises that I can play around with mm. that's why he's interested in which is not necessarily a bad thing because sometimes you can do good with that. He did good with the Star Trek at the beginning. Yeah. And then... Yeah, then it went quickly yeah. downhill. <laughs> but that's the thing. When it comes to like almost strangling that opportunity to have creativity, you're really just following what... and the It's not just fans. It's like the business narrative wants. Mm. And any time they do try to pull in something different, even Rian Johnson's uh, Last Jedi, like it made loads of money. But it was hated by Star Wars fans and he was going to do his own Star Wars trilogy. I don't think there's been a film that's come out in the last 10 years that hasn't been hated by Star Wars fans generally. Like <laughs> There's always been a portion of Star Wars fans that have hated the film. In fact, since the original trilogy, really. There's, but now it's, it's much more um, accessible on Twitter and things like that. So you, you have these sort of... Uh, fan factions mobilizing in some in some way well this is Um, it star wars has always been a stubborn fan base it's a dedicated fan base that if they really like star wars they know the whole entire world they know everything about it mm. so when new creatives try to bring ideas into it some respond in the most aggressive manner possible (laughs) and just it, it seems so small but because everything is so important on twitter nowadays like, it can really ruin someone's life to be given so much negativity. And it happens with one of the actors. Um, I can't remember her name. And I haven't seen the film, so I don't know why. But there was so much <laughs> negative, like, aggression towards her. And it just felt, like, so unnecessary. Hmm. It's just not that important. <laughs> I love films. I adore films. But if someone wanted to remake something or tell a story, I wouldn't violently, aggressively attack that person for telling a story in a different way. I wouldn't That's say, what makes it exciting. I wouldn't say violently. I mean, it was it was violent threats on. Twitter, oh yeah, yeah. yeah right. but, and obviously, you see that um, that kind of toxic level of fandom in Marvel as well. Um, and it does feel like let's be Marvel. Fair. Mar- I think Marvel really is a, a <laughs> child of of sort of that Star Wars kind of mentality of creating something that is is vague enough to allow anyone to identify with it and. Um, and is good for selling toys. I mean, I know obviously Marvel was a comic book first, but the way that the films have have worked feels similar in in some ways. Do you, do you kind of get what I mean? I do. I mean, like a lot of that's to do with Disney, but then because everyone's been taking that approach recently, because DC are in the same. Like yeah. their fans are crazy, and they still think there's going to be a Justice League Snyder cut. You know, they're obsessed <laughs> with that shit. But like, I think this is the general problem with fandom. Fandom holds on to an idea. And because for a long time, Star Wars, Marvel, DC, all this stuff was a very small group of fandom. That was, it was an important group, but now it's become a very mainstream thing. Mm. And those ideas just get, it just gets a little bit more muddled. Yeah. 
they get watered down and kind of bastardised and yeah. yeah and it's not Star Wars's fault it's Disney's fault <laughs> yeah it's the fact that Disney made it a bigger thing like because there was such a long break between Revenge of the Sith which was uh, 2005 mm. the next Star Wars film was like 2015 because it's not yeah. been it's, it's not been that long that we've had loads of Star Wars and everyone went yeah, shut about yeah. Star Wars and that's like, that's a long time and fans just grow. And they grow and grow and grow and there's obviously computer games, comic books, whatever to bring it on. But because Disney bought it, they made it huge. They did exactly the same thing with Marvel. There have been many Marvel films before um, Disney got involved with them. Mm. And they were nowhere near, apart from the Spider-Man films, and if we're looking into the 90s, none of them made as much money as anything in the 2000s. And like Disney just bought the brand and went, we're going to make this huge. Mm. We're going to make this big. And they did. The first film made, I think it was 2.3 billion. Bloody hell. The Force Awakens. Yeah. And the other one made 1.6 billion, and the last one made like 1 billion. Which is, <laughs> again, you can't appease the fans. In the old days, the Star Wars fans, they would, they would just see where the storytelling is going. Mm. But now they believe they know where the storytelling is going. And I think generally, I, I, I'm glad Ryan's not here. But the fact that there are so many YouTube videos talking about Star Wars and where the fan theories, fan theories, fan theories are very toxic because they generally can overtake where the story was going because the people get so annoyed about it and be like, well, this is what everyone thought it was going to be. And it's like, well, that's not what they wrote. That's just what you collectively people on YouTube sat and spent ages and spent hours just talking about and people that are addictively just following your ideas that's not where the story was going. It kind of feels like religion in that in that respect. Like, it, well, it, that's it. Star Wars is a religion. Mm. That is why it is genuinely recognised, or at least the old thing of you could put yourself as a Jedi on the. Yeah. You know, it, it, it happened so long ago, and because it was a small, like a small religion, <laughs> but now it's dictated by, well, just Disney's capitalist greed. Mm. It's just everywhere, and it's got so toxic, and and also Star Wars, has, it's. None of the films are making as much money that Disney expected. Sure, in the beginning, but Han Solo was a massive flop. Mm. And the fact is, if you, if you really like Star Wars, from what I hear, everyone just wants to talk about The Mandalorian. And again, that seems to play completely into going, right, we're going to be just like the first three. Mm. And when you get nine films in and you're still going back to let's be like the first three, it gets a bit dull. It's, it's very similar to like a lot of franchises that have been around for too long. Mm. Alien... Yeah. If there's another Alien film, it's like, why? Just, just let it rest for a while. <laughs> the first Alien's great. Second one's great. After that, they get continuously worse. Predator. All these, mostly space films, it seems. Yeah. And I think that was one of the things we were discussing well, earlier. With soft sci-fi films. Yeah, right? that's it. Soft yeah. sci-fi completely dictated where sci-fi was going. Before that, if you, if you think about the sci-fi films before Star Wars, they were more philosophy-driven. Mm. They were more questioning ideas. It wasn't about the adventure. It wasn't about playing to crowd pleasing, you know, making you feel good or making you want to be like, oh, let's see where this is going. It was more just like, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey, mm. which is just so crazy, but it's considered, it's a mainstream sci fi, really. Everyone knows what it is. Mm. There's a director whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce, but he made El Topo, and he's a Chilean director. And he wanted to make a version of Dune which uh, Dune was eventually made by David Lynch and is going to be done by the guy who did Arrival uh, coming out later this year. We'll see. Now, this version of the film that he wanted to do, he wanted Pink Floyd to score it, he wanted Mick Jagger in it, he wanted Salvador Dali on the art team, and they were just like the most insane, huge budget, philosophy-driven sci-fi, and they would not touch it. And then some of those ideas were taken apart and put in different films, and they were heavily taken from Star Wars, which kind of produces like a popcorn version of those ideas mm. and I think that's where the studios went money mm. we can get money from just giving them a little bit of those big ideas tying it to some more popcorn general you know love stories or just you know one of the things that always annoys me about Star Wars is little comedy guys <laughs> there's too much of that trying because it's appealing to the kids and yeah. it's not appealing it's not appealing you know <laughs> And that's the thing, when it comes to like those sort of things where you're making like a watered down version of something that could have been a lot better, but the studios didn't fund that film because it was probably crazy either way. 
but they didn't fund it because it was too big of an idea. And the studios stopped wanting to fund those big sci-fi films. And it shows in history that when a sci-fi film has had the massive budget, even the Blade Runner sequel, mm. they're bombed. They're remembered. And the ideas are explored and discussed more than a lot of like the more fluffy process, pr procedures of um, after Star Wars. Because mm. there probably was like... Because the thing is, I don't know personally, but there must have been a glut of Star Wars wannabe films after Star Wars. There must have been loads. Yeah, you'd imagine so, but I, I guess none of them have really... Uh... I think it's the, the way that Star Wars is structured. Loads of people always say, yeah, that's basically Star Wars. That's basically Star Wars. Because mm. it's an easy structure that people... Well, it's, it's, the, it's the chosen one kind of yeah, idea, isn't yeah. it? Like it's, it? It's played out in so many other things. And that's it. That, that's it. Star, Star Wars personally just doesn't do anything to me that makes me go, wow, that's different. I think the th the thing to me is, I don't I don't understand what the rebellion is fighting for. Um, if you've got a good answer, uh, put it below. But I I I just have I, I there there doesn't seem to be um, a particular uh, ideology or, or philosophy that they're espousing. Um, there seems to be no sort of idea of what they'll do after they've beaten the empire. That, that stands out to me there might be in some um you know star wars book somewhere that you know <laughs> well that's that's the other that's thing. the thing is there's so much content like how can you how and can you sometimes you have to like it's like from what i remember the new one the, the um what's the new one called god i don't, I don't the know the rise of the skywalker that's, that's the it. one um when that film came out they did there was like some story points to do with the old old man villain Palpatine and he had to play a computer game Fortnite to be able to get it which is ridiculous and he did exactly the same thing with a character which people went oh that must be um, I can't remember his name it's not Han Solo it's the Boba Fett what the the guy who has the Millennium Falcon in in yeah yeah oh Wait, his Lan Lanzo Calrid Calridian, something like that. Yeah, th that dude. <laughs> like, there's a character in the new film from what I've heard who's pretty much his daughter, but they don't reveal it in the film. But when you read the book, like the companion piece book, it will tell you, "Oh, this is his daughter." And it's like, what's the point? It's just doing it for money. <laughs> but but again, that's Disney. That's always Disney, and that's the direction Star Wars continue going into. But I think I think it also plays into that, like. <clears throat> that toxic fandom of having like more answers than someone else because you've read another book or you've, uh, you know, it, it gives. It, you think it, you're ahead. So yeah, that's our perspective. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're right because obviously there is a massive audience for these films. Mm. It's just when people go on about Star Wars, I feel like people forget too easily things with it. They're, they're too dominantly like this is this. I find it strange that people see him as the greatest films of all time, or at least like their favorite film of all time. It's like, I just there's more to cinema than just Star Wars, and that's my problem with it. But I know that at the same time, there's a great appreciation for it, and it's it's good that there is actually that much love for a film out there. Yeah, I mean, I think to me, I, I loved Star Wars when I was a kid, but that's the that's kind of that's how it. I see it yeah. is that it was They're it was kids. a thing for kids. Like I love. Power Rangers when I was a kid I wouldn't I didn't see the new Power Rangers movie um, it's it's that kind of thing to me and I understand that like obviously that's people get so much out of it um, but I just don't I don't understand it to me I, I like something that's a bit more substantive and um, detailed uh, in terms of like in terms of like the, the, the understanding of society and, and sort of reflecting society itself. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's why I'm not a big fan. Sorry, guys. So if you've uh, enjoyed what you've liked hearing, that's not how he does it at all. <laughs> that's been Trash Hour's Take. Thank you very much for listening. Um, we'll be back to normal with Ryan this Sunday. Don't forget to like, subscribe. And uh, comment if you if you disagree. I mean, we're not going to argue with you. You we can might. just say, well, you you might, but say what you like. Peace out. <laughs> Ta da. <laughs>